Welcome to episode 227 of CPP Cast, the first podcast for C++ developers by C++ developers. I'm your host, Rob Irving, joined by my co-host, Jason Turner. Jason, how's it going today? All right, Rob. We are C++ developers, but we are not professional audio engineers No, or but podcasters. We're, we're doing our best. You know, you'd think after 200 some episodes we would uh, have this down, but we're having all, some technical difficulties today before we got started. Uh, yeah, if you notice the anything go weird fine. like audio dropping out or something, we don't know what's going on. Sorry, <laughs> we'll figure it out. I can't keep it stuff together. It's okay. <laughs> anyway, um... Uh, how you doing, Jason? We, we're a week away from uh, Christmas. How you doing? Ah, oh, a week away. Yeah, you uh, ready? Yeah. This is probably I our guess. last episode of the year, I think. Yeah. I just found out that my in-laws are coming into town for Christmas. Yeah, so. I got my wife's entire family coming here, too. Yeah. The entire family? Uh, she's one of five, so her two brothers and one of her two sisters are coming. And parents? And her parents, yeah. So most wow. of the family. Yeah. And cousins or, or nieces no. and nephews from her perspective, I mean? No. There are no uh, other... Uh, her one sister's not coming has kids, but the other ones don't yet. Yeah. Wow. That will be a pretty full house, though. Yes, it will be a full house. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, at the top of every episode, I'd like to read a piece of feedback. Uh, this week, we got an email from Matt uh, related to the ongoing discussion we've been having about C++ ABI. Uh, he said, another situation where ABI is important is expensive third-party proprietary libraries. A uh, company where I work requires a high level of support for all software we don't write. So they go to software companies for this. In my current project, that company requires a new support contract for each compiler, which runs in the six-figure cost. So cost itself is another common situation in industry where ABI compatibility is important. Uh, luckily, our latest project is on new hardware and compiles, which required an ABI break, and they moved from C++ 98 to 14. I uh, love the podcast. Thanks for your efforts. So, yeah, I mean, that's not something we talked a whole lot about, but that makes sense that if you are dependent on libraries that you pay for, that you're not going to want to, um, you know, want them to change very often. You know, I'm thinking I could have come up with a support contract model for ChaiScript where I charge six <laughs> figures for each build that needed to be made. Not too late. <laughs> Okay, well, we'd love to hear your thoughts about the show. You can always reach out to us on Facebook, Twitter, or email us at feedback at cbgas.com. And don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes or subscribe on YouTube. Joining us today is Ken Musith. Ken is CEO and co-founder of Voxel Tech, which contracts to tech companies primarily in the movie and aerospace industries. Ken currently does contract work for SpaceX and Weta Digital. Previously, he was director of R&D and senior principal engineer at DreamWorks Animation. He was also a professor in computer graphics at Linkoping University and a visiting faculty member and research scientist at Caltech. He worked on trajectory design for the Genesis Space Mission at NASA's JPL and in 2015 received an Academy Award for the development of OpenVDB. Ken, welcome to the show. Thanks. Great. Great to be here. You know, so your bio has built right into it a question that I've been wondering about recently, and that's professorship. So you were a professor. Do you have a PhD in a related field, or is that because of your experience that you were made a professor? How did that work out? Uh, that's actually a, a, a long story. So my background, my PhD is in uh, physics, in quantum mechanics. Okay. Um, and I came to, to Caltech in, I believe it was uh, 1999, uh, as a as a physicist or chemist, uh, and after about a year and a half, I changed field to computer science. So I spent about five years sort of transitioning from one field to another, and after that, became a professor in computer graphics in Sweden. Uh, okay. So strictly speaking, my background is actually not computer science, but I've been a professor in computer science. So, yeah. Uh, kind yeah of but and, and you said your background was quantum physics. Yep. Yep. Quantum dynamics. So, so the idea that you can simulate um, um, molecules, uh, very small molecules, I should say, like three or four body molecules using the, you know, the um, the principle of, of, of quantum mechanics from from uh, from scratch. Um, so it's it's funny because it's it's a field where physicists would say, you know, it's not really physics because there are too many particles, and chemists would say it's not really chemistry because they're not enough. So sort of in, in between the two fields. Uh, but it involves, it, it sounds like a, a strange transition to go from, you know, uh, quantum mechanics to computer science, but it's not that big of a stretch in the sense that 
what we did was everything was simulating on, on computers. So okay. that does that background give you any insight into the hype around quantum computing? Probably not. No. Okay. <laughs> but it, it, it I think it has certainly if you if you look at what I've done in, in uh, computer graphics and computer science, it's definitely flavored by, you know, the physics background. Sure. So most of most of what I've done um, in the movie industry has been physics-based uh, simulation. Also, the stuff we do at SpaceX, you know, is, is physics-based uh, computation fluid dynamics. So, it's it's there somewhere in the background. Wow. Oh. Okay. Well, Ken, uh, we have a lot to talk to you about, obviously, with uh, OpenVDB and everything else you work on. But first, we just have a couple of news articles to discuss. Uh, feel free to comment on any of these, and then we'll start talking more uh, about everything you do. Okay. Cool. Okay, uh, so this first one is an article from uh, the PhD. We've had him on twice on the podcast before, uh, and it's going full circle on embed in C++. And um, he's kind of going over the latest efforts to get uh, the embed proposal standardized. And it uh, starts off great. Um, he presented the paper in front of the Evolution Working Group, and he got a very great response. But then he went on to SG7, where they kind of pushed back on him a lot, said it should have a more generic API, and told him to go investigate the way things are done with this circle programming language, which I had not heard of before. Have you, Jason? Um, maybe. Maybe? I don't, I'm not sure, actually. <laughs> okay. Well, and then the interesting thing is he kind of, you know, does a bunch of tests to, uh, you know, kind of show the committee how embed works and um, eventually goes and, and looks into circle and sees how, goes to see how it would work in circle and winds up talking to the author of that programming language who decides he's going to go ahead and make a embed feature for circle instead of uh, doing whatever it was the committee is trying to have him do. Yeah. Right. So I think maybe filling in a little bit of like, Background in this story, as I understand yeah. it, that that wasn't explicitly listed here, is with Circle, uh, if I understand correctly, Circle can do anything at compile time that could be done at compile time. Okay. So they are able to open a file, just use IO streams or whatever, and load that into a compile time buffer. Right. And... I believe that's what the standard committee was asking John Heed to look into, like what, as far as a more, because I read this several times going, what the heck do you mean by a more generic approach? Like yeah. read over yeah. that sentence. I believe that's what they're looking for is can we do this like regular file IO at compile time? Mm -hmm. And so you can do that in circle, but it's crazy, crazy slow. So the right. author of circle is like, oh no, it's actually better to have a standard a language feature for this. Exactly. Which is what John Heed is trying to do for C++. Yeah. Yeah. That's why he feel like he came full circle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I, I looked at some of the comments on, on Reddit, and um, I know John Heed is, uh, seems a little sad at the end of this blog um, and a little unmotivated maybe, but I, I do hope he kind of goes back to the committee and, and kind of presents this, you know, says, look, even the, the you know, language author of Circle is going to go and make this a feature like because it doesn't make sense to do it the way you suggested. So I hope he goes forward with it. It seems like a great feature. Uh, yeah, I'm totally in favor of this. And we haven't let our guests speak at all uh, <laughs> on this. Like uh, from I've worked on several projects. And in fact, I'm working on one right now where being we need to embed raw file data in the C++ executable. And there's certainly linker hacks and there's uh, conversion to like bin hex kinds of things that you can do. And they're all just kludgy. And being able to just directly like embed the file right there to me would be usually helpful. Is this anything you run into in your work? Uh, we typically roll our own uh, uh, I.O. routines. Uh, so I, okay. I.O. Is, is very, very important for um, actually in VDB. Uh, we support uh, delayed loading. So the idea that you you load data on demand uh, and, and can sometimes unload it again. Uh, and the, the best way of getting really good performance is to sort of make use of the fact that you know um, you have first-hand knowledge about the, the data layout in memory 
and you reflect that in in your out of memory representation. So, yeah, we we tend to roll our own to be honest. Um, and you so then you're never really concerned about like including things at compile time, like embedding resources in. No, I don't think so. No. Okay. Uh, we can just go through these other articles real quick. Um, Qt or Qt uh, has a 5.14 update. Uh, a couple interesting things here. They have a, a new graphics stack that is not based on just OpenGL anymore. You can uh, be, you know, have an abstract layer on top of Vulkan, Metal, or Direct3D, which seems great. But uh, you know, I'm not really an expert on Qt, so I can't speak too much to this. I do have a question, I guess, for our listeners, if anyone feels like chiming in on Twitter or Reddit later, mm -hmm. is uh, the last large, cute project that I started on was now about 10 years ago. And when I was doing the GUI work on it, so I, I had a little bit of a, a gap in my cute experience. It started in like 2003, and I used it for a few years, and then I took a couple of years off, and then I went back to it. And I'm like, well, it seems everyone's using like QML or whatever now to do like the layout of your GUI instead of hard coding that directly into the C++, which is the old school way of doing it. Mm -hmm. I could not get anyone else on that team to go along with like using QML or QT. Well, I don't think, I don't think QT Quick existed yet, but QML anyhow to do the like markup for the GUI layout. And I'm just curious for our listeners, what do you do? Do you hard code your GUIs in C++ or do you use one of these modeling languages that Qt has provided? Yeah, I mean, I know we've done episodes on Qt before, but maybe uh, it'd be nice to get someone on who, you know, has been using a lot of Qt to make, you know, GUI applications. Talk about and, it more. And ideally, someone who's been doing it for like 20 years so they know yeah. the whole history of how these things went. Right. Okay, and then the last thing is C++ Now is accepting student volunteer applications. So if you're interested in going to Aspen in May, uh, you should definitely sign up. Absolutely. Yeah. Anything else you wanted to mention about that, Jason? Well, I mean, we've had so many students yeah. and ex-students come on the show. It's uh, There's a couple of um, testimonials here from people about how it kind of changed their career and stuff. And, uh, yeah. I mean, it's almost certainly not a bad idea to get a free trip to Aspen as a student and meet a bunch <laughs> of people in the C++ industry. Yeah, definitely. Okay, well, a listener uh, wrote to us a few months ago, Ken, suggesting we do an episode on OpenVDB, which uh, I mentioned in your bio uh, you won an Academy Award for. Um, could you tell us a little bit about uh, what OpenVDB is? Sure. Um, so OpenVDB is essentially two things it's a um it's a compact data structure uh it's a data structure that essentially allows you to associate values uh with coordinates three-dimensional coordinates so given an xyz index uh which actually can be negative they can have negative values too um you can associate a value and that can be it's templated so it can be um you know it can be a float it can be a vector it can even be a, uh, a set of points. Um, and the idea is that this, this data structure, this layout is sparse in the sense that uh, it's only allocating exactly, um, or not exactly, it's, it's allocating as little memory as, as allows for fast performance. Uh, so the footprint grows as you add more and more values to this, uh, to this volume. Um, so that's that's one component, and the other component are uh, a very large uh, library of tools that are written on top of this uh, data structure. So the data structure itself is what's called VDB, uh, and then there is this pretty uh, significant tool sets, uh, and it's it's been you know it's been developed primarily at uh, DreamWorks Animation, uh, and it's now become sort of the de facto standard for for volumes in visual effects. But it's also used outside of outside of the, uh, the visual effects industry. That's sort of the, the, short, the short version. So I, I think it's important to realize that it's, you know, it's, it's fairly easy to write a, a fast uh, volume data structure. It's also fairly easy to write one that is sparse and doesn't occupy a lot of memory, mm -hmm. but it's actually surprisingly difficult to write one that's both fast and sparse. And mm -hmm. that's, that's sort of what this, um, 
that's the claim to fame for for this data structure is that it's 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 fast it's obviously not as fast as a dense volume but but pretty close uh it has the same api uh so you can you can set values um what this is what we call random access so given an xyc you can set a value or you can get a value um and it also uses iterators to visit values that you already set inside the the data structure so it's a little bit i mean you can draw a lot of analogies to to the standard library containers like an std vector or some of the other ones um so an std vector just to use as 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 an example has um very fast random access because mm -hmm. we can look up a value associated with an offset in o1 time complexity so super quick uh it's not as fast to insert values because as, as we all know uh, an std vector doubles its uh, allocated memory pool when we sort of exceed uh, the current buffer. So in worst case, we actually have to reallocate and copy values over, uh, whereas VDB actually achieves um, O1 complexity both for inserting and deleting values. Mm. Um, and then it, it, again, so the same analogy, so we have, just like we have iterators on an std vector, we also have iterators on a VDB container. So as you set values, you can then revisit the values and sort of massage the values either, you know, if you do physics simulations or geometry uh, manipulation, that's that's a very convenient way of, of doing it. Um, I think some, some of the other highlights is it's unbounded, which actually turned out to be, um, I was very excited about it when I achieved it, but there was a lot of pushback from a lot of the uh, uh, the, the users because uh, it's sort of a paradigm shift because normally when you deal with volumes, you sort of define a box. It's almost mm -hmm. like a sandbox and you do your your computation inside that box and you just pray that you never sort of run run out of space because if you do, <laughs> then you have to reallocate everything and, and sort of continue. Um, Whereas VDB, there is no box. Like you can literally associate a value with any index value uh, within 32-bit uh, precision. Um, so as let's say you, you're doing a fluid simulation um, and you may not exactly know where the fluid is actually ending up or you do a smoke simulation. The traditional way of doing it is you set up a box, you release your fluid and you keep simming. And as soon as it hits the boundary, there's the, you know, depending on your boundary condition, you you may uh, you sort of you're certainly losing any anything that goes on beyond the boundary. Whereas for these types of grids, they keep adding values, um, so it can literally go on f almost forever. Um, now, of course, you're still you're still paying the cost of allocating the memory, so it's it's not there's no free lunch. Uh, right. Right. But but at least you're only allocating. Uh, what you need, and that's that's really the the main benefit. Um, I think an, another uh, nice feature is that it it sort of has a built in what well, what we call a bounding value hierarchy. So it's almost like a, it's an acceleration structure that tells you where you have interesting information in the volume, um, and that that that's very useful for things like uh, rendering or ray tracing. So when you're shooting when you're shooting a ray. You're trying to create essentially an image of, let's say, a smoke cloud or a, a water simulation. You need to know where you have information. You don't want to do ray integration through all of space, you know, because there's a lot of potentially there's a lot of empty space. Um, and because VDB is actually underneath, it's a tree. It's a special type of tree. The nodes of the tree also tell you. They give you spatial information about where you have in uh, information where you don't. So you can sort of do intersection tests of the ray against these uh, the extensions of the nodes. Um, so that's that's very useful for for several applications. So when you iterate, uh, just like taking a step back for a moment, you when you iterate, you're not going to iterate over every possible point in space. You're going to iterate over all the points that have a value currently. That's correct. Yep. So so. Sort of the the one extreme, uh, hypothetically, the one extreme would be, 
I'm only going to store in this data structure the exact values that you push into it. Um, that's you know typically how an STD vector would work. Um, the problem with that is that the cost of inserting an element and looking it up can be costly in 3D because you don't know where these values are. They can be anywhere. They can be very sparsely populated in space. So what VDB does, instead of only inserting that one value, it inserts uh, a tiny uh, box, a cutout of the surrounding space that the point uh, belongs to. Um, so it is over allocating a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, um, and so as you allocate a new, this is, this is actually what's called a, a leaf node in the tree. As you allocate a new leaf node, put a value into the leaf node, you need a way of marking that this is, this is a value that you inserted. Um, and it does this using bit masks. So there's a, there's a single bit associated with the exact value that you just pushed in there. Um, and this turns out to be extremely useful for many different applications because this bit mask can be used not only to sort of identify the value again, but you can also use it for iterations for, for these for when you implement the iterators because the iterators now essentially become uh, uh, you know they're, they're, they're searching through the bit mask they're searching okay. for uh, on on bits and off bits um, and this can be done very efficiently you can also there are also other operations that you can perform so imagine you have you have two different grids two different trees and you want to perform a boolean operation like you want to do essentially an uh, an intersection. Mm -hmm. Now you can actually do that using these bit masks as well, because you can do bitwise uh, or operations. So how large? I, I'm, I'm sitting here basically thinking, okay, you're trying to minimize the number of dynamic allocations. You're trying to maximize your cache friendliness and performance. How large are the uh, the over allocated hunks that you do? So so that's you can configure that. Uh, okay. The default configuration has a leaf node size that is eight by eight by eight. Uh, okay. So we've done many many experiments uh, that seem to suggest that that is an optimal sort of uh, balance between performance and and uh, memory footprint. Um, on the GPU, interestingly, uh, this tree tends to operate faster if it's if it's a larger leaf node. So sixteen by sixteen by sixteen mm -hmm. is typically what we use there. Uh, but but you can actually you can configure it so the implementation is highly templated um, in fact the the leaf node itself is templated on the value type uh, you know it could be double it could be a float it could be a vector it could be a point and then the child node of the leaf node the internal node is then templated on the leaf node type and you sort of uh, sequentially or hierarchically template until you reach the root node and the root node is then templated on all the, the nodes below it. Um, and this turns out to be, um, it's, it's very, very good for performance uh, mm -hmm. because we get a lot of inlining uh, and we can do uh, template uh, metaprogramming. So a, a lot of the executions that are needed to traverse the tree are actually resolved at compile time. Um, so that's that's kind of that's part of the secret sauce to to the good performance. Um, does that affect compile time adversely? It does. <laughs> so <Okay. laughs> so this is this is one of the complaints. In fact, if you uh, if you listen to the keynote from the CPP con, uh, the keynote speaker Magalan uh, yeah. actually used OpenVDB as an example of. Uh, you know, he. I think he even called it overuse of, of templating. I obviously disagree <laughs> with that, but but it is true. You can you can uh, you can get some pretty hairy compile times. Um, but honestly, I would much prefer longer compile times and faster execution run times. So. Sure. Okay. I'm not going to argue with you. I've, <laughs> I've heard. I've been involved in lots of discussions recently about. Which do you prefer, and how do you set that balance, and how do you weigh the developer's time versus the, you know, like what, like what is the most important thing for your project? And it sounds like runtime performance is the most important thing to you. Yeah, that's yeah. 
but I, I, I see the other side of this as well. It, I, I understand that it can be frustrating at times. Right. So just out of curiosity, how long are long build times for tools using your open VDB? Um, it's funny because building the library itself, you know, takes no time because it's just essentially header files, right? Oh, right, right. Uh, but, but building client code, uh, uh, actually building, let's say, the, the unit test that, that the library comes with, that uh -huh. can take, uh, I think, depending on, a, on, on your, uh, your hardware, it can take five minutes. Uh, and, uh -huh. Building and running, so yeah. I've heard much, much, much worse. <laughs> right, right. I, I think actually, I think the biggest complaint is is the memory usage that you use. So if you just let's say you have a you know sixty four core machine or even thirty two core machine, and you just do you know you just let it go, like you know make minus j, uh, you can actually run out of memory even with sixty four gigabytes. Uh, because it just uh, just you know keeps spawning build jobs and they take quite a lot of memory, um, right. so sometimes you yeah got to be careful. I just want to rewind a little bit and make sure listeners uh, understand what it is that OpenVDB is is used for. You mentioned like smoke and fluid analysis, right? Um, so it as I said, it was it was developed. Um, initially for visual effects, uh, okay. so volumetric um, simulation. Um, but it's not, it's not sort of limited to that application. It is actually being used in engineering as well. Um, so the stuff that I'm involved in at SpaceX makes use of VDB. Um, so there's nothing, there's nothing limiting it to visual effects. Um, but anything that involves uh, a sparse volume, so a volume um, that doesn't require information everywhere, um, and I, you know, that, that that is not not every application lends itself to 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 these these sparse applications or sparse data structures, but a lot of them do. Um, so yes, fluid animation is is a great example. Uh, manipulating geometry, um, fire simulation. Uh, there's also in engineering things like topology optimization, where you're trying to determine the shape of a uh, material to meet certain constraints, like material constraints, uh, stress, uh, things like that. Um, it can be used uh, for scientific visualization, medical imaging. Um, yeah, it's it's really really up to you. We've We've had lots of people reach out from fields that we never thought of would, would make use of this, uh, which is quite exciting. Uh, since I've never done anything like this, I find myself slightly surprised that uh, integer coordinates give you the resolution that you need for these kinds of simulations. I would have just assumed that you would want floating point resolution or, or something. Right, so that's a, that's a good point. So... Um, Oftentimes, when you solve uh, problems in engineering, uh, and that you know translates to graphics too, you're trying to solve these uh, partial differential equations. And a very common technique is to sort of discretize them on a grid, a background grid. Um, but you are right; there are other ways of doing it. You could also have used particles instead, okay. where the particles you could essentially think of it as grid points that are free to move around. Um, so. And and VDB actually supports both, so you can you can also store particles associated with in in, in the grid. So each each uh, voxel. So a voxel is a is a three D analogy of a two D pixel. Okay. Uh, so it's just a you know it's a it's it's the smallest unit that you can address in in a volume. Uh, and you can have you can have particles that live inside that voxel, or you can have a single value, a single floating point value. Um, but we tend to use these grids for solving um, things like fluids. Um, but as I said, you, you can certainly also use uh, particles and floating point positions. Okay. Um, Uh, you mentioned that there's a lot of tools uh, that make use of OpenVDB. Are these part of the library? 
Yeah, so so the library itself uh, has implemented a lot of high-level algorithms, things okay. like, um, you know, how do I go from a polygonal representation of a surface to one of these VDBs? Uh, how do I go, so, and how do I go back again? How do I go from a volume to a polygonal representation? This is called scan conversion. Um, so, so the truth is, most of the surface representations that we encounter in certainly in visual effects, but also in engineering, are actually modeled um, using triangles or or quads, mm -hmm. so poly polygons. Uh, think of a you know a computer aided design CAD CAD model. Um, it's typically triangles. Um, right. So how do you take that and sort of represent it as a volume instead? Um, that's that's a quite a challenging. Uh, task and we have algorithms in the library that does that for you, um, but there's also all the, um, you know, all the mechanics you need to solve these equations that I talked about earlier. Like when you, let's say, you're, you're doing a fluid animation, you're doing fire or explosion. Uh, we actually base that on um, what's called the Navier-Stokes equation or equations. Uh, these are equations that come out of physics. Uh, it tells you exactly how the fluid is changing over time. Uh, and it involves these partial differential equations, and we can discretize it, we can solve it on the grid itself, and we have libraries, support libraries in there. So most of what uh, ships with VDB is quite low level, um, and so there are many uh, commercial packages that sort of pick up VDB and implement it uh, inside their own uh, inside their own node graph or inside their own render. Um, so I think I think the probably the most well-known example is uh, Houdini. So Houdini is a is a third-party commercial product, sort of the de facto standard for for visual effects, um, and it internally uses VDB for sparse volumes, and makes okay. use of a lot of these algorithms. Um, and you mentioned uh, on the side, and I, I let it slip past, you said when you're doing these things uh, on the GPU, so does that imply you have like built-in support for doing these calculations on GPU? Great question. Um, no. <laughs> so, okay. so, so, so VDB, which if you download it today, is strictly for the CPU. Okay. Uh, but uh, I and others have, have certainly been you know, playing, toying with what does it mean to take the ideas behind the data structure and porting them to the GPU. So I would say a lot of this is ongoing work. Um, but yeah, so, so my, my uh, own discovery, and that's been backed up by, by other people I've talked to, found that the, 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 the configuration that we use on the CPU is not ideal for the, for, for the GPU. So especially the, the leaf node sizes are too small for the GPU. Mm. Um, but this, this is actually this is an area I would I would love to uh, uh, work some more on, um, putting putting the library and putting some of the algorithms to to GPUs. And I, I mean, obviously you're using C plus plus, and you were just talking about templates and template metaprogramming. And I'm just curious, like, uh, have you been following the C plus plus standards? Like, where what what do you require today? Um, so we yes we we do <laughs> so. Uh, the industry as a whole, the visual effects industry, tend to be a little bit slow, uh, but we actually have a, a committee. Uh oh, you know, did I lose you guys? You, uh, the we, last we you lost you for just a moment. Yeah, yeah, you said you have a committee. Oh, okay, so the, there's a there's a committee called the the visual effects VFX platform uh, that keeps track of the different versions of libraries and compilers um, that the industry as a whole uh, uses. And right now we're using, we're up to C++ 14. So that's also what we use in, um, in OpenVDB. Um, and, you know, we're, we're very eager to move forward, but we have to sort of follow the standard. So we're trying to be good citizens. Sounds almost as bad as the auto industry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, so so we're at GCC. Uh, I think it's six three or six two. Uh, oh, well, that, that's all of 
all yeah. of C plus plus seventeen language support, but not all of C plus plus library support. I was just looking this up yesterday. Oh, <laughs> right. Coincidentally. <laughs> cool. Uh, I was so, looking at the. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no. Go ahead. Go ahead, please, Rob. Uh, I was going to say I was going to. I was looking at the last uh, change log uh, for I think version seven of OpenVDB, and it mentioned um, new measurement analytics for level sets, and I was curious what exactly is a level set. <laughs> so this is. I have to admit, this is one of my absolute favorite topics. So I'll okay. I'll try and restrain myself and be short. So um, as as I mentioned earlier. Um, most of the representations that we use for surfaces uh, are, are, are polygons. Um, and polygons are great for modeling, um, but they're not ideal when a surface deforms or changes. Uh, imagine that you have a, a, a surface that represents the interface between water and air, so essentially a water surface. And let's say you throw something into the water and you create a splash. Uh, crown splash with lots of droplets that are uh, being, you know, um, that are, that are formed and breaking off the main surface. So essentially, you have a very, very complicated surface that changes over time, that deforms over time. Now, this is this is a, a great example where these polygon representations uh, really struggle, because as you can imagine, as 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 the surface breaks up and collides with itself again. Um, Figuring out exactly how to represent that with, with polygons uh, and triangles um, and vertices is a very, very challenging task. So it turns out that there's a much, much simpler way of representing surfaces that change what we call topology. Uh, so they essentially they break up or merge. Um, and that is to use what's called a level set. Um, and the level set is, it's sort of a glorified isosurface. Uh, uh, what is so, that? <laughs> so what is, what is that? So um, I think most of us are familiar with uh, height fields, right? So okay. if you have a topographic map uh, yeah. and you have, it's, it's in 2D, um, and every point on this map gives you the height of the landscape or the mountain. Um, and you can sort of, you can draw uh, contour lines and these contour lines connect all points at the exact same height. Right. Um, so it's a great way of sort of, um, you know, conveying visual information about how tall is the landscape, how does it vary. Um, now, if you take that idea and, and add on an extra dimension, so we're no longer talking about a map, we're talking about a volume. So at every single point, X, Y, Z, we have a single value associated with it. Um, so now we have a volume with values, and if you now imagine that you you uh, defined a surface that consists of all the points with one specific value, so it's sort of a it's a it's a height field but in three D. Okay. This is what we call an isosurface. It's like trying to visualize a hypercube, basically. Like it's, it's very a... difficult. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you've never tried it before, I'm sure you'll get a headache. Um, but so, so that's that's sort of the the simplest idea, uh, an isosurface. Uh, that's been around for many many years. Now, level sets takes this slightly uh, further, to put it mildly. So, it adds a lot of mathematics underneath that tells you how to massage the values in order to deform the surface. So, let's say you're actually doing a fluid simulation. Um, we represent the surface, the water surface itself, using one of these level sets, and we can move the the water surface around um, and 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 sort of create the illusion of you know a, a crown splash or um, you know breaking dam or whatever some 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 complicated behavior of the water by uh, solving equations that massage these values, these level set values, okay. um, and then you may ask so. What, what do these values really correspond to? Um, and typically they are the distance to the surface. Hmm. Um, and it's actually often the sign distance. And the convention is typically every point that is inside the surface has a negative value, and every point that is outside the surface has a positive value. Um, and then obviously the 
the ISO surface that I was talking about before now is the zero level set. So all points that are exactly zero are exactly on the surface, and that's the surface that you're tracking. That's the surface you're interested in. Um, and there's, there's 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 one there's one more um, link to to VDB. So as you can imagine, since you're really only interested in the zero ISO surface because that's where the surface is. Mm -hmm. Everything else is kind of redundant. Like you don't actually need to track the exact values that are very far away from the surface. Right. So, so if you take this to the extreme, all you need is a is a very narrow band around the surface itself. This is what's called a narrow band level set. It just means I only need distance values in close proximity to the surface that you're deforming. And that, as you can imagine, is a very sparse data set, right? Because as soon as you're, um, you know, a certain distance away from the surface, you don't care about the value anymore. Mm -hmm. But when you're close, that's when you want to store the value. And this is where VDB is ideal, because you have a very sparse volume that only acquires values in close proximity to the surface. Um, so instead of storing you know, a, a box of values everywhere, which, as you can imagine, will be very, very memory expensive or memory heavy, uh, especially if, you know, this box grows over time. VDB allows you to only allocate values in close proximity to the surface. And the values will be updated as the surface starts moving. Um, so in that sense, it's, it's almost the ideal memory footprint. Um, you guys look like <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I, I'm thinking uh, like when you first presented this topic of um, of what open VDB is and how it can store you know any objects in the 3d grid my immediate assumption is like okay at this point one two three I have a particle with these properties that's moving in this direction or I've got a voxel that is this color but it sounds like that is just the wrong way to think about this entirely. Like it can be used for those things, but if you really want to get the most benefit out of it, you need to think of it for of a, a meta level. Like it can just be used to do anything that you need to be keeping track of that happens to be, or like properties about properties or something. Sure, but but you actually nailed it because okay. at, at the core, it is exactly what you said. It's... It's the ability to associate values with X, Y, C, or I, J, K coordinates. Right. If you can do that, there's a lot of other things you can do. Like, you can actually deform it. You can, um, you can, um, as the surface is, is moving through space, mm -hmm. you need to allocate and move these grid points around. So when I say move, I don't mean move in the sense of, uh, you know, pushing particles around. Right. What I mean is you need to allocate new grid points and maybe remove old grid points. Um, so as you think of, um, think of a grid in, in, in three-dimensional space, mm -hmm. uh, and as the surface sort of sweeps out uh, this 3D space, certain grid, it's intersecting certain uh, grid points in this in this volume um so just the, uh, if i can pause you for to pause you <laughs> for just a second make sure i'm following along because at the moment i'm visualizing as you're saying this surface of the water right because this is where your example started i'm visualizing like the outside of a fish tank right where i can see the surface of the water in a 3d volume that's that's limited right is that is that okay that's that's great, except I want to get rid of the tank itself. <laughs> because right, okay, okay, okay. In the, in the sense that, I mean, it's, it's a good mental picture because this is actually how people would traditionally do volumes. You would have a you would have a fish tank, and inside the fish tank you would have a grid, a three D grid, mm -hmm. and you can associate a, a value with every single grid in the tank. Um, what VD does, VDB does, it gets rid of the tank itself, right? Because there are no there's sort of no spatial limitations to where you can have values. Okay. Um, but it also uh, sort of trims away values that are away 
from the surface itself because they're kind of redundant. You don't really the water need... at the bottom of the tank's not going to move. That's right. right. So you that's can right. te- do you, can you set a limit and say anything that's outside of the range of these particles I don't care about, or do you manually do you manually have to prune them? Uh, so so that's that's part of these the application that you write on top of VDB. So VDB has uh, you know low level methods to add values and remove values, and even um, sort of dilate values. So you can imagine that you know I have I have inserted a few discrete values into the volume. Yes. And now I want to add all the neighbor points. That's oh. that's a, an operation called dilation. Okay. You can also do, you can do the opposite. You can say I've added lots of values and I now want to shrink it. That's erosion. Uh, so the data structure itself supports these fairly primitive operations and the client code can make use of it to do things like uh, tracking how a, a surface of water moves or you know uh, taking taking geometric pieces and gluing them together unioning them together um, these these are yeah these are the, the higher level uh, application you write on top of it but the data structure itself supports these fairly simple operations um, okay. that become sort of the building blocks um, but yeah so the 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 whole gag is that you want to perform certain operations using as little memory as possible. Um, right. And and the reason you do that, obviously, is that you want fidelity. You want your surface to be high resolution, as, as high as possible. Uh, and if you take the traditional approach, which is when you have your fish tank, if you if you make the fish tank really big, then the overhead of allocating this, you know, uh, redundant memory can very quickly kill your performance and even your computer. Like you can, <laughs> can quickly run out of memory. Uh, right. So you can care about just the particles that are on the surface, and if the surface moves up, trim the particles that the the data that used to be below it. If it exactly. moves back down again, trim the old data. Exactly. And you're always using the optimal amount of memory. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yep. So how many particles is a lot in your world? Uh, I'd say over a billion. Over um, a billion is a lot? Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's that's starting to push. But, I mean, yeah, it it it, it obviously depends on, on your hardware. It depends on your application. Uh, so there's sort of a, a golden rule in visual effects, which is, you know, your simulation should never be longer than you can, you know, an artist can run it overnight. Uh Whereas in scientific computing, you know, oftentimes we run simulations for weeks or even months. So, right. it, yeah, it depends on, on the application. So a lot of the, the kind of questions that I, I'm personally asking you right now is I, I've been having classrooms full of physics students this past year. And I've been trying to think, okay, how do I tell them about this library and what application does it have to them when simulating subatomic particles, basically? Ooh. Right. I, oh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, does does your application involve volumes of some some kind? So actually, there's there's another thing. There's another um, line of applications that it's also very useful for, which is, let's say you have, uh, you actually have particles, and the particles move around, mm-hmm. uh, and in many applications, you need to know um, about the the local sort of topology of the points. You need to, you need to search your your immediate nearest neighbors. Right. Uh, so, at, you know, the classic way of 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 solving this problem is to use things like a, a KD tree um, um, as an acceleration structure. The problem with with a KD tree is, as you add more and more points, um, these search operations uh, have an unfavorable scaling. They can get very very slow. Um, okay. So. This is another example where VDB can actually be, be used and has been used. So you can imagine that you use VDB as a way of bucketing points. So you, you have your points and you shove them into a VDB tree um, and they may fall in different voxels, different nodes, um, but because VDB can do O of one lookup, so it can very quickly, you can very quickly ask the following questions. How many particles are stored at this position, IJK. Um, right. 
Now that can be sort of a building block for exactly answering the question of how many particles do I have in, in my immediate neighborhood? Um, so that's, that's, that's another, and I, maybe, maybe that is uh, an application for, for your students. I don't know. Uh, I think, well, we're, I think running low on time now, but, uh, their, their simulations currently are closer to like ray tracing and they need to know, is there an object in this point in space that I'm going to intersect and what are its properties? And then what does that do to the refraction of this particle? Right. Yep. That, that's, that is definitely uh, sort of a, a common application. So you can, if the, what, whatever object you're trying to ray intersect with, mm -hmm. if you can uh, sort of voxelize it, if you can give it a, a gridded representation, right. Uh, imagine that it's, um, I don't know, it could be a polygon, it could be some shape. If you have a, a, a way of, uh, essentially detecting what grid nodes does my object intersect with. Right. These grid nodes you can then uh, mark as uh, active in the grid. And then you can shoot a ray through the, or, or, or against the, the tree structure itself. Because you can do very quick ray intersection test against the tree structure. Um, so essentially what you want to know is does my ray intersect, you know, any grid, uh, any objects as it's going in a certain direction, right? Um, and exactly that that type of test can be done very efficiently against the tree itself. It sounds so, like you could choose between accuracy, like you you could say, well, uh, no, nothing was there, so I'm going to give up a little bit of accuracy. Or you can say, okay, there might have been something there. Now now I have to actually verify that yes, I did exactly intersect something. Correct. Correct. Yep. Okay. So you can you can sort of you can skip empty space quickly, and then you have a candidate. Right. So you you're right. You still have to do uh, a ray intersection test against whatever object you have, but you want to limit that because that's typically very costly, mm -hmm. uh, and you certainly would prefer only to check the ray against a single candidate or maybe a handful of candidates, not all of them. Right. Uh, so yeah, that's that's a very common type of of test. Thanks for letting me uh, pick your brain on that. Hopefully, for our <laughs> listeners, that was interesting as yeah, well. Yeah, cool, cool, absolutely. Okay, well, I think we are running out of time, but uh, before we let you go, I don't think we ever said what does uh, VDB actually stand for in OpenVDB. <laughs> it's it's a funny um, it's a funny question. I get it a lot. That the dirty secret is actually nothing. It's it's an acronym, <laughs> <laughs> and the story behind it is. Um, it, it was called many, many different things in the past, uh, and sort of the last iteration, I was calling it DB Plus Grid. Uh, and as we were sort of releasing it into the wild at DreamWorks, a lot of the artists were saying, you know, this is too nerdy. We have no <laughs> idea what 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 that means. So we actually had uh, we asked people like, what should we call it then? And VDB was one of the top candidates that came out. Um, I mean, you 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 could still. You know, an obvious candidate would be a volumetric uh, database or volumetric dynamic B plus tree or whatever. But the truth <laughs> is, it means nothing. <laughs> it's, a, it's just a name. <laughs> Wonderful. And, uh, you yeah. also mentioned that there's been Academy Awards involved here. Is that for any particular movie's work or is it be one of these technical Academy Awards for technical achievement or something like that? Yeah, or? yeah it was a, a technical uh, Academy Award, technical achievement award. Um, but it has been used in more than 150 movies at this point. Uh, oh. So, but you're right. It it wasn't it wasn't for a particular movie. It was as a as a technique. 150 um, movies. That's a fairly yeah. good bit. Yeah. Yeah. Was there it, was there a particular movie you were working on that kind of initiated the development of OpenVDB? Uh, I think the first one that we applied it to was Puss in Boots. Uh, oh, okay. Okay. We were modeling these. Uh, uh, very intricate uh, detailed uh, clouds but it wasn't I wouldn't say it was developed for that movie but that was sort of our first test uh, but since since it's now uh, found its way into some of the commercial packages it's you know many artists may not even realize that they're using it uh, right so so it is a free open source license that it can be integrated into other commercial practices. Absolutely. It sounds like. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, we didn't and discuss that at all. 
<laughs> that's true. Actually, I should probably mention that um, it was, you know, it was it was primarily developed at DreamWorks uh, with, uh, I had three other guys joining the, the project. Uh, it was Peter, Mihai, and, and David. Um, and since then, all of us have left, and uh, it's now actually run not by DreamWorks, but by the Academy Software Foundation. So oh, wow. it's sort of so a, it's an official library. I oh guess. yes, it's now sort of a, a neutral, neutral uh, entity that's that's running it. Um, so that, that's quite exciting. So that's sort of uh, the project is getting a second second wind. Uh, there are some you know ver very talented people from other other studios that are now pitching in and helping. So it looks like everything's up on GitHub. If any of our listeners are interested. Yep, that's right. That's right. Very cool. Okay, well, thanks so much for coming on the show today, Ken. Well, thanks for having me. It was yeah, fun. Thanks for coming on. Yeah.